of Real Talk, where we put the real in real estate. And I'm really in the Metrotex headquarters today. This is the first time we are going live from Metrotex. Uh, and I'm so proud to have my esteemed guest, Christine Hansen, 2025 NAR First Vice President candidate and an amazing broker owner from the wonderful state of Florida. Christine, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Ashley. I'm really excited to be here. I think there might be a few things to talk about today. Just a few things. We were just discussing offline when we did our run through last week. It was actually the morning of the day we got the verdict. And so we had said, well, hopefully we'll kind of know some things to be able to better prepare um, for this evening. And I don't think there's any true preparing. Um, I think right now what we can do to serve our audience, uh, whether it's realtors, affiliates, or the consumer watching us this evening, uh, we really need to talk about what this means um, in regards to the lawsuits. Um, first off, obviously, the Sitzer Burnett um, lawsuit did come to a verdict last week. And unfortunately, NAR and the subsequent uh, corporate co-defendants uh, did lose that verdict in the Sitzer Burnett case. Um, so, Christine, maybe you can kind of talk about a little bit about what the crux of that, that seller's class action lawsuit was um, and of course, calling it again, the Sitzer Burnett, we've had some other ones arise, but let's focus on this one first and the verdict and what kind of sum that up for layman terms for our audience. Yes, um, absolutely, Ashley. You know, the, the frustrating part is this whole lawsuit is really basically saying that the sellers ended up having to pay more than they needed to by being by having to pay the agent that brought the buyer and that their costs were inflated and that they didn't get any value from a realtor bringing a qualified, ready and able buyer to close because obviously, as everyone out there knows, that we don't really get paid anything unless we have a successful closing. And so they, they were saying that it's a, coll a collusion. Uh, NAR is involved with making it to the point where this is something that everybody has to do. And and the, the hardest and the saddest part about this whole thing was there was 11 days of a trial where the NAR and the two other um, co-defenders um, presented everything. And we had evidence, we had material, we had witnesses. The jury took less than an hour and a half to, to deliberate, came back, asked about, um, you know, uh, information with regards to the, um, the awarding, how much they could award is the damages, came back an hour later, and we were done. So, you know, obviously, they did not understand. I don't know, because, you know, Ashley, we weren't there. And yeah, we sure. can sit there and, and guess about this stuff. The most frustrating thing is, is everybody as a realtor that's out there listening and then for any consumer everyone understands and knows the value of a realtor and what we do and until a successful is a transaction is successfully closed we don't make any money and so you know what industry works like that so um it's been it's been really really frustrating now the good news is is because this happened nar is definitely going for an appeal we are yeah. asking for a mistrial immediately and there will be an an appeal 100 percent. this is going to go on for a while so it's not over and that's really i think what we need to talk about yeah and i think that's the other thing too this didn't come out of left field this 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 case was going on prior to covid um, and so it obviously just caught steam here recently because we were going to trial. Um, and, and I think that's something that people aren't aware of, too. They think this is just something that happened this year. It did not happen this year. We've been working on this in the background for years. Um, but but the appeal is one thing, um, you know, it, it's but this is an area of opportunity. We were talking earlier where there where there is crisis and chaos. The other side of that coin is an opportunity. And, and I think that from, you know, our side, from a from a trade association side and, and practitioners, you know, Christine, you've been in the business how many decades now? It's well, 36 years. So going okay. almost on four decades. Yeah. Four decades and two myself. So 60 decades between the two of us. Um, you know, there there's something we we discussed, you know, and not going on a tangent from the lawsuit because we are going to continue to talk about the updates of what that means, what the probability of potential changes are, regardless of the appeal status, everything else. But you know, the the biggest thing is we talked about when we got into the industry, there was a very different model that was there. Um, in regards to um, mentorship and education and value proposition and oversight and 
as our industry has continued to change at a very rapid pace, we've had to change with it. Yes. Um, and I think that opportunity now is to go back to the fundamentals and really realize without technology and without all those fancy tools and lead sources and everything else, what did we do when we first got into the business? Right. It was a people relationship building business. Right. You yeah. know, and so, um, I mean, there was no online MLS, you know, right. there was none of, none, none of yeah. this. We were pounding the pavement and advocating yeah. for our clients. Yes. And I think this is the opportunity to get back to the fundamentals of recreating what our value proposition is, because unfortunately, I think that's a little bit of it is we've lost sight of, and it's not that realtors don't know what their value proposition is. Yeah. We've lost sight of articulating it. And we do have to get back to articulating our value proposition because we can control that. Right, Christine? Absolutely. And going back to just something about the lawsuit, was there claiming, you know, that that realtors are um, like, you know, we're all in cahoots. We have yeah. very strict code of ethics. We cannot you and I cannot have a discussion about what commissions we charge. We are what? so structured in regards to the fact there's none of that. And so to try to make people believe that realtors are doing all of this stuff just because we have figured out how to be able to cooperate and to comp compensate for the better. Right. of the buyers and sellers that we serve they're attacking us it's just it's crazy and like you said it is a people to people business and mm -hmm. every realtor out there knows that we have to justify our commission because it is always being questioned so it's not like they sure. don't know and yeah so it's it's making me crazy when i think about the basis of this lawsuit and the misinformation it's you know and one other thing really quick as we get onto this yeah. crazy tangent is what scares me more? So Ashley, ask me, what scares me more than these lawsuits? Christine, what scares you more than these lawsuits? What scares me more is people rushing, taking misinformation, taking all the drama and the fake news and making business decisions and decision, decisions and choices from this misinformation. We're in, we're fighting back. There's appeals. Nothing needs to happen except for what you're honing in on, which is that we have to articulate our value. But that's what scares me more. And right now we've got a lot of realtors attention and this is real talk, right? So yeah. we need to be the voice. We need to say, okay, we've got everyone's attention. Now, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing. Again, where there's chaos and, and friction, there's opportunity. And I think that's what we need to be focusing on is we don't know what the result is going to be in the policy change or additional disclosures or anything else like that. What we do know is control what we can. Like Cher said, uh, yes, we should get back to the fundamentals, buyer presentation, sit down with each person and yeah. give them the value. We talked about that again. I was sitting there and going, do you know what happened and made us complacent? electronic yeah. forms, electronic forms, which are great because they take the friction out of having to drive across town and try to sit there and get, you know, wet signatures in person and do all those other things. But with the ease and removing that friction, we stop sitting at a kitchen table, flipping those agreements upside down and saying, okay, Mr. Seller or Mr. Buyer, you know, we're sitting there and we're reading all those things and we're explaining paragraph by paragraph, which was an opportunity for dialogue. And when you're sitting there and talking about compensation from the buyer's agency agreement, the buyer broker agreement, well, when you're when you're explaining it, then you have that dialogue of what that looks like. And I think we need to get back to explaining the agreement, still use the amazing electronic software signing and everything else. But that's something that we need to get back down to doing. Uh, Michelle had a question. Does NAR have a hotline set up that realtors can ask questions or make suggestions on the case and new cases that are popping up? Mm -hmm. Christine, are you aware of any type of, of hotline or mechanism where people can, can reach out? I don't know of a hotline. That is such a fantastic idea. So I, I have to assume that if there isn't one now, the one is in the works. There sure. is the website, uh, competition.realtor. And yep. I know that there's a lot of things that they're putting in as far as updated, good information. So it's competition dot realtor and you can definitely go in there and they're having up-to-date information on the cases q and a's yep. talking um pieces i think there's something in there that's like a hundred and 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 73 things that realtors do to show value sure. so absolutely yes 
All right, Mr. Philip Walker, a friend of mine and uh, a leader in our organization, he said, it seems that NAR hasn't taken any steps to educate agents about changing the way they discuss commissions with consumers. Why wasn't that done immediately when the lawsuits were filed by DOJ and then others? It seems we are a little bit behind the curve. You know, and that's fair, Philip. Yeah. I mean, because like I said, this is not a new lawsuit. Um, I think we definitely talked a lot about that, but... Um, now we're having to speed that up considerably in our conversation. So, Christine, do you have anything additional to, to comment on Philip's uh, question? I think that when the, the lawsuits have evolved because it started out small and then they got it class actioned and then they started to, to, to change it. And so I think it's been kind of a little bit of a moving target. And I do know that for the last several years, um, when you t when you listen to legal counsel at NAR, when you listen to the different things they're saying, use buyer broker agreements. Make sure you tell our story uh, back yep. in 2019 when John Smaby was president. It was own it, own our story, tell our story. Yep. So I think they were trying to push that out. But I agree, like we need to now, I feel like we feel like we're behind the eight ball, but we never expected with all of the different suggestions that could possibly happen as an outcome on this first case, an, an hour and a half deliberation was never yep. one of them. I mean, they're ready. We're, they've got a team. We can't second guess it because we haven't been there. Yep. I'm not on the leadership team yet, so I can't sure. speak for that. But I, I do feel like it, I understand exactly, Philip, how you're feeling. Uh, and I know they were trying to continue to push people not only to tell the story, but to start utilizing and really talking about buyer broker agreements. You know, I think in, in the day and age that we are, unfortunately, we often allow things to happen to us before we're going to course correct and proactively react to it. And I think that's kind of one of those instances where, just like Caitlin Kirk said, I'm shocked it's gotten this far. Yes. I think a lot of us did not expect it. And, and again, right, you shouldn't assume because what does that do? <laughs> um, you know, but but now we have to understand that there are certain things that are just completely out of our control and out of our hands. And it's interesting. So you've got Catchmark, which is one of the attorneys. Um, and then, right. Yes. <laughs> um, so you've got Catchmark that is making his rounds. Um, it's very interesting. If people have not heard him speak or his interview, it, it will not justify the position. In fact, from a, from a true realtor practitioner side, um, it will actually infuriate you further as to what that position is, which again, which is why it's so frustrating. Right. And, and maybe, uh, Linnea, you said you heard the jury was made up of renters, no homeowners. I do know they were trying, you know, to make sure that the, the jury pool Everyone. was equitable and it wasn't people that were just going to be pro realtors and everything else that very well could have been the case. Um, you know, that's, 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 that's difficult to navigate though. Christine, did you have something to say about that? There definitely was homeowners on there. Okay. Um, you have to remember this shifted to a class action lawsuit and they went out and they, they found people to join this class action suit. Yep. Like they, they went out and advertised for it because I, and the funny part is, and this, this attorney, like when you say his name, I just have to cringe. Yeah. It, it, because it, it's a, it's a money maker for him, I think, and I'm not sure if this is true or not. But I had heard that his fee from this was like 548 million dollars, and and you know, and they're coming after us. And if you really look at what the average realtor makes, I just you know, it's it's really sickening. But I love the fact that you said, Ashley, we have to be proactive. Yep. I'm tired of us having to be on the defense. We need to go out and show our value and be much more aggressive. Well, and I think that's the thing is, is being aggressive. What was interesting too, that one of the, the gentlemen that joined the class action lawsuit, though, he's also going the rounds with Catchmark and on the stand testified. And when they asked, did you have a pleasurable experience with your realtor? And he said, yes. I know. He wasn't dissatisfied with the representation. He just felt like after it was all said and done and the dust settled, and then of course the class action came up, he thought, you know, I paid too much. Right. And, and that's, so interesting to me. Okay, so let's go back to our industry because we can get really frustrated what we've done from the realtor industry and advocating and trying to, to be better and more aggressive in this. But it just shocks me because look at attorneys, right? Or let's not mm. even talk about just on, on Catchmark. Attorneys, if you actually elicit an attorney's help, they're not going to guarantee you the verdict. In fact, Christine, I mean, Catchmark obviously took the class action lawsuit on contingency. So when you take something on contingency, they're basically say, hey, I'm in it with you, but I'm going to take a bigger piece of, of the settlement should we win. I think it was 35 to 40 percent. 
something yeah. of that nature was the contingency fee. And so we didn't know what that was going to look like. Or if you don't, I won't take your case on contingency, but I'm going to require this retainer up front. I'm going to have billable hours and right. I can't guarantee you what the result is going to be, but you're still going to pay. Anybody that's utilized an attorney service kind of understands how their compensation structures work as far as that's concerned. And what people don't understand is the majority of realtors, there are some that I do know that actually set up a retainer and look at consultation fees and other things out. But the majority of realtors don't, we basically work on contingency, a contingency yeah. based on there is going to be a transaction and a closing at the end of that agreement. But in what industry would somebody say, I'm willing to work 18 months for you, advocating for you, spending money on your behalf, not even knowing if there is going to be compensation at the end of that advocacy and representation. And I think that's the hard part. And that's the story that we can control on this end, not, not in a, not necessarily in a courtroom, but as realtors in a whole, we can take that messaging, tell our story, tell how that that is. And when we are representing a buyer or going on a listing appointment, um, you know, Oh, Chato, do not put my name in the in the chat. Red Ridge Realty, which is my firm. All right. Are you implementing anything new in your business as a result of this lawsuit? Um, no, I got to be honest, and this is not sitting here and, and trying to toot my own horn. There's a reason why I'm president-elect of the association, not because I like this pretty office um, that I'm sitting in. And it's not my office. It's the boardroom and that everybody gets to sit in here. I'm president-elect of the association because I want to advocate on behalf of, of realtors. And this is something that I've been extraordinarily passionate about as a second-generation realtor. My mom got a real estate license um, because we moved to Texas and, and we got horribly screwed in a real estate transaction where we were misrepresented by, uh, this was before buyer's agency was, was involved. And so who represented us represented the seller. The seller was also the builder and we lost about $250,000 um, buying our first house in Texas. And my mom said, you know what? That's never going to happen to anyone else again if I have something to say about it. And she got her license when I was 15 years old. I became her assistant when I was uh, 16. And, and she really invigorated me to do that. So our, our business model has always been leave our client feeling like they didn't compensate us enough at the yeah. end of the transaction. And yeah. if you can sit there and say, my clients are sitting there and saying, I don't think I paid you enough then we're doing what we're doing. And so I, I think you just have to look at things through different prisms. Um, so Lupe, I think our, our esteemed, uh, you know, Oz in the background put the website on there. So it's competition.realtor uh, to be able to see the updates on there. Um, all right. Michelle okay. said, will NAR share to the media our information on what realtors do and how our compensations are done? Christine, do you have any insight on that? Um, yeah, so they've been sending and pushing things out for quite a while now. There is also websites that, and I, I'm trying to remember because I know everything you can get through competition.realtor, but there's so many different media ways that they've been pushing things out. NAR even has a talk radio that they've pushed things out. There's so much information. And I think what happens is, is as realtors, each and every one of us basically wakes up unemployed every day and we're focusing <laughs> on the business at hand. I mean, we really are. Yeah. And then we hear about this lawsuit and all of a sudden like, wait, what the heck is going on? So I definitely think that the biggest thing that NAR can do, and remember, we have to remember we have ownership. We are NAR, right? Yes. The yeah. biggest thing that NAR can do is to make sure that we have the information that we can push out to our fellow realtors that aren't on here, not listening to Real Talk. They're not, right. you know, and also to our consumers and have those conversations. So as a broker here in, in, in the state of Florida, what I'm doing with my agents is I'm saying, listen, I want you to know there's nothing that you have to do that you're not doing already as far as telling your story, knowing your value. However, if you start to see a lower compensation in the MLS and what my company, every company sets their own commission structure, um, if something less, I want you to know the vehicles that you have available to you in order to be able to get your professional fee. So we are looking into that and working, working on that. But again, as realtors, it's our responsibility to educate the sellers on the value of cooperating and compensating a, another realtor. I used yep. to say when I was a listing agent, there's one of me and there's thousands of other realtors that have the connections and the relationships with buyers that may want to buy your home. And they're yep. more than likely 
any seller that you can say, I can bring you a qualified buyer ready and willing to, to buy your property at the price you've agreed to, of course they're willing to, to, to pay that commission. So that's why this lawsuit is so frustrating. Well, and, and, you know, it is frustrating. And, you know, what's also frustrating, Christine, is the fact that the minute that the verdict was, was rendered, um, another one popped up. You yes. know, and, and that's hard. And what we need to understand is we keep on focusing and, and it's not to bring anybody in this, but this isn't just a lawsuit against NAR. It's a lawsuit against our industry. Yes. It's a lawsuit against our brokerages. It's a lawsuit on our livelihood. And so, you know, the 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 last one we had uh, Remax settled. Um, yes. I think they're still processing that settlement, but yes. Remax um, was an, an anywhere both yes. settled outside of this lawsuit. But KW and Home Services of America were also co-defendants with NAR in this Sitzer and Burnett. Um, now we're going to a situation, Christine, where, you know, there's tons of other brokerages that are now being named in this secondary class action lawsuit. I believe yeah. Compass, Wakeart, United. Um, um, EXP, Helena. Yep. Yes. So yep. nobody is impervious to that. And I think that's the one thing that's been a little frustrating for me. Yes, I'm an independent, uh, you know, brokerage. But at the same time, I think there's there's agents out there that took a very holier than thou attitude and was like, NAR, you know, failed us and all of these other things. Well, what about what about the other corporate entities that were named in these lawsuits? Because you could sit there and say the same thing. No, absolutely not. You know, we're, we're all sitting here entrenched in this together. And I think the best thing we can do is understand that this is something that's coming for our entire industry. And we need to educate. I saw somebody say, what are we doing from the NAR standpoint, Christine, to get that image and that 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 information out? I don't know about you everybody's saturated with information, right? Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, there's so much. Your sphere of influence is still the one that you have the most ability to have that captured audience base. So NAR can do all the things and they do. We even laugh here, you know, at Metrotex and somebody will say, well, I didn't get that email. And then Sav will say, well, you opened it three times and then you opted out, you know? I mean, like, what are you going <laughs> to do, right? Because we right. get so many emails, right. but that's the same thing too. NAR can do these things till they're blue in the face. We have an app, we have a website, we have radio ads and streaming channels and conferences and all these other things, but it's really us. It's Christine Hansen. It's Ashley Gentry. It's everybody else as an individual practitioner practitioner that can go out there and disseminate that information to people that know, trust, and respect you. And Absolutely. that's how we're going to continue to get the word out. All right. So we've been inundated with some comments. Um, so let me jump in real quick, Ashley, yeah. on the other lawsuit. The other lawsuit yeah. now, because it's named all of the other, a lot of these other companies, and then they are, is now a national lawsuit. So it's taking it out of Missouri. It's taking out of the, uh, there's going to be a whole new trial. There's going to be a whole new, in my opinion, different verdict. So now we're going to have different lawsuits. Um, and different verdicts. I, I really, truly believe that. And we can yeah. go back to this date that I said this here, but I really do believe that. And so it's yeah. called a split verdict. And so that's going to have to elevate it to another court. And I think that this is going to take years to, to get through. Yeah. And I think it's going to make its way to the Supreme Court. Yep. And the, you said that this is an attack on our industry. And I yep. asked, I agreed because who's the one that advocated and fought so hard to keep banks out of real estate? It yep. took NAR seven years of advocacy and fighting to keep banks out of real estate. And then in 2006, we finally got them out or 2007. And then right. when the market crashed, all I have to say to realtors is short sales. And they go, oh, could you imagine if we hadn't been fighting for that long? So yep. we do fight the, the good fight and it takes all of us to do that. Well, it takes all of us to do that. And, and I know people say from a trade, you know, association side, whether it's local, state or, or national, things move too, you know, too slowly. We can't turn the ship and do all of these other things. Well, guys, these are also, for the most part, volunteer leaders that are sitting here yes. and, and, and helping. Yes, we have staff. Yes, we have doing things. But this, these are member run organizations. And I know I'm not sitting here and not taking accountability that we can't be better and do better. That is something that I know, Christine, you and I share the same. You're running for 2025 NAR first vice president because yes. you have a passion to Absolutely. bring something to the table. And, and we can't sit there and say that that NAR, unfortunately, on another side, hasn't had their share over the past several months of some really negative PR. And I think there's a compounding fact from the National Association of Realtors side because we are one of the defendants amongst all of these other corporate entities 
but it's the what happened at NAR prior to from a cultural side, from a leadership side that I think is a compounding effect with frustration. Yes. Um, so, you know, I want to touch on that. Let me get to a couple of questions, but then I want to redirect back what we can do from an organization uh, to continue to help turn turn that perception. So Sherry Fearbacher, there's this crazy lady. Let's go to her comment. That happens to be my mother, Christine, and the co-owner of Red Branch Realty. So, uh, but unemployed every day and yet have absolutely no ceiling. Take care of your people, dig in and study your industry and give back to your people and successful longevity will be yours. And that's the whole point. We need to, we keep on going to everything that's negative and the sky is falling and what can we do? But there are people that still need our services. They still 100%. need our representation. They still need our advocacy advocacy when we have a looming recession and unemployment's going on and, and the cost of inflation on everything, interest rates, everything else. This is when a realtor more than ever is sitting there and going to be able to advocate for every stitch and every dollar for that buyer on this. So, uh, yeah. um, so hey, going there, was, there's three or four, go ahead, Christine. It, when you talk about that, the first thing I can think of is how we advocated. And these, like you said, they're volunteer members and then yep. it is NAR staff, but they're being paid by our dues, right? Yep. And so we fought to keep the 1031 like kind exchange. Yep. Buyers and sellers are benefiting from what we've done to help yes. them. And so I, we could go on and on and talk about all the different advocacy efforts that we've done and all the things that we've done for buyers and sellers. And I think if we really ask the mass population, they are happy with what we're doing. So this is really an opportunist that is getting into people's ears and it's just, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, I no, I love it because I know we can go on a tangent all day long, but we're also... Um, we're, we're also involved, you know, and so I think we take for granted sometimes, and I've said that I, I've taken for granted the fact that I do know what's going on because I've gotten involved and I got involved because if somebody's going to make decisions on my behalf, I want to know what those decisions are. I want to have a voice and a seat at the table. I'm literally sitting at the table right now, yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. the table that I have a voice to say, no, this isn't what's best for our members. And this isn't what's best for our organization. Or yes, let's do more of this. Yeah. Um, so going back to those, some of the string of comments, it's really uh, several we're talking about. Are we looking at different tactics for representation and, and how we're going to approach a new trial or, you know, from the appeal side or even new trials that are coming from additional copycat lawsuits that are coming up? Christine, have you heard anything about a different angle um, that we might approach next time? The, the, the thing that I've heard is a couple things. One is obviously they've learned some things. Again, the jury deliberated for an hour and a half. So it's kind of hard to figure out what it is. But now that there's going to be this whole new lawsuit, the what was explained to me and my understanding was in the first lawsuit, we had a very narrow window of what we could allow in. And so we only could address the specific allegations and the judge was very tight on exactly what it was. And we were denied a lot of what we wanted to do. Now okay. that we're going to have this national lawsuit, I think it's going to open up the door. They're bringing in a lot more like all these other real estate companies. They're going to have an opportunity. And we're, we've learned from this last one. So yeah. I, again, we're feeling extremely positive that we are on the right side of this and we will prevail. It's just, we have to get everyone to hang in there, do the work. Like you said, be involved, be the voices when we're pushing things out, get involved, know what to do and, and work with your customers and with your fellow realtors. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, there's there's some other things. I know uh, we've got Ed Eakin and Travis Lee are kind of going back and forth and making the comments. And the crux of it is there's some people that think, you know, decoupling, um, you know, the MLS and taking away the trade organizations because we can do our own database um, and, and we can share um, listing, um, you know, listing data between ourselves. And what do we need the trade association for? Which again, is so interesting because are, are we just saying that, that what we're devolved is just data checkers and disseminating listings? 
You know, is that what they think that, you know, from a realtor practitioner, I can tell you all day long, I think it's great that consumers have access to data. They still don't understand what filter and prism to put it through. They send me a listing and they sit there and go, hey, I found this on this other syndicated online website, but I don't get it is, you know, and going through and understanding everything that's going on there. So the MLS is great for, you know, real time qualitative data, but it also allows us uh, to disseminate that appropriately to our clients. But if you think the trade organizations are just there to provide MLS access, again, I take accountability. We can do a much better job of articulating what we've done in regards to 1031s and keeping banks out of the real estate industry. Uh, how about, you know, our transfer taxes and our commissions being taxed? Um, right. You know, there are so many different things that we advocate for. And again, we, I think sometimes those get lost in the minutia, um, but we need to do a better job of, of advocating for all of our wins and our triumphs um, Ab- you know, yes. for the consumers. Absolutely. We're looking now and what I'm listening to and hearing at the national level is looking at tax reform and yep. being able to create some sort of, of um, vehicle where investors that do own these five, six, seven, eight hundred homes would be yep. able to get some kind of a tax benefit if they sold those homes, especially to the first time home buyers. Now, yep. again, everybody is going to benefit from that. And so these are the things that we have to remember is the big picture of that. So. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, again, you and I, we, we have a passion for similar things. And so we can, we can continue to go on. I don't want it to be in our own echo chamber of knowing again, what we're doing. I think, you know what, this is also an area of opportunity to club them and drag them and get more people involved to actually listen and, and be there to, to be in the front lines and understand what NAR is doing, um, what your state association is doing, what your local association is doing. Um, Okay, so let's talk about those copycat lawsuits. One popped up right away, um, I think within hours of the verdict coming through. But the one that's probably got everybody going, what is going on? What darn tarnation? And that will show you, you know, that I'm in Texas over here. um, Is the, there's now a buyer's class action lawsuit that just came out in Illinois. Um, So Christine, have you gotten to to read at least a a surface level value of what they're talking about there? The the only thing that I've heard about that, and I haven't dove into that, there's just been so much going on. I haven't been able to get deep into that. The only thing I can think of, and when I read this and I'm looking at this is, okay, so now they're saying, and this, in the other lawsuits that these poor sellers have been harmed. Now they're flipping it and saying buyers are being harmed. And, and I just, I, um, I do believe that, and we were expecting, and we did know that there would be copycat lawsuits out there. Yeah. And I, that is something that I, Ashley, I don't even know how to respond to that question at this point, because I don't know if there's going to be more and if they're going to be smaller in, in locals and states. I don't know. I, that's yeah. something I just I don't have an answer to. Well, you know, I'm going to need you to whip out your crystal ball, Christine, if we're going to be able to continue no. to have these. I'm just joking. I mean, <laughs> the hard part is like you would sit there and you go, OK, I would expect other sellers copycat lawsuits. No. I think the buyers one kind of came out of left field. I was listening today in preparation for for what we were going to be talking about this evening. And the the crux of it is basically now buyers are going, whoa, 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 whoa. So you mean I don't get to dictate what my agent gets compensated for by the seller? And therefore, I'm paying more for that property for my agent to get compensated because I didn't pay for their representation out of pocket. Yeah. And you know, you, what's, what's so funny is when you look at any scenario and you look and say, okay, so if you ask a buyer and you went right down that perfect road, you say to a buyer, okay, I'm, here's the fee I'm going to charge yep. and it's going to be hourly. And whether you find a house or not, you're going to pay me. Whether the seller accepts your offer or not, you're going to pay me. Whether the inspection comes through or not, you're going to pay me. It, the buyers have it good right now. Yep. They only pay and I say pay because again yeah. we can argue who's paying. And sure. let's just say, let's say we own it. We say, okay, the buyers are paying, whatever. It's still added into the price or the financing of the home, which is yep. amortized generally over 30 years. And buyers yep. usually aren't in a home for 30 years. So sure. we can, you know, we have so many. How many times if we ask realtors, we've shown buyers properties and we've shown them for years because they didn't have the the means to buy what they wanted or they were just kicking the tires for a few years. 
it's it's just that when we start to really look at the economics of it and we really look at the fundamentals of the money, I think they're going to want to walk this back. Well, and I think that's it, it's so hard um, because, you know, I don't want to get into the weeds on class action lawsuits, but, you know, there's there's a reason why people cringe when when you see them, because the recipient of the benefit of everything when you're talking about mass class action lawsuits is these people that have joined them. They're going to get pennies on the dollar of what's being awarded, you know, and ultimately exactly. that's the frustrating part of it, too. Um, but the biggest thing is, is, you know, I was kind of laughing the other day and I'm like, OK, you know, if we want to sit there and, and charge like an attorney structure or something else like that maybe that people would have proper boundaries of, of time, time in which they're, they're contacting their, their buyer representative and their advocate and everything else. Because when you talk about attorneys, you're like, Ooh, I probably shouldn't call them. They're going to probably bill me and round up to the hour. If I ask that question, I can figure that out myself. And we don't want to go to that. And that's not, that's not degrading the compensation structure of attorneys. It's just saying, we want to be in it with them. We are fighting. We are advocating. We are pounding that pavement because we want to see that buyer achieve homeownership or investing for their future, right. you know, obtaining a retirement plan, whatever that is. It's exciting to yes. see that get over the finish line. And I'm willing to sit there and say, hey, I'm in this with you. And I only get paid if I deliver on the results that you're looking for. And that's, I think, what's frustrating. I saw somebody else sit there and say, well, who's going to do a class action lawsuit against the bread makers? They were like, Wonder Bread, you know, Butter Bread, <laughs> all of these other things. It's usually between about $3 and $4. You're paying for a loaf of bread. Right. So because there's a consistent roundabout price that people can stomach to buy a loaf of bread, now all of a sudden it's a monopoly. Okay. And I think that's the other thing um, that people are talking about is that standard commission. Yes. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that is something that we can educate the people that are on this right now. Um, yes. They kept on going back to price fixing and that there's a standard commission rate and that we're coaching our agents that this is what we charge. You can't deviate. It was in policy manuals. There's scripts around that training, everything else. So, Christine, can you talk about, again, being a, a broker owner yourself, um, you know, what that looks like? Because there is no price fixing. That is an antitrust situation. There is not a standard commission. Um, no. But can you kind of walk us around the argument of, of what they were insinuating on that side? Absolutely. You know, when they're trying to sit there and say that because we have the MLS and because you can look at the MLS and see what you as a realtor are going to get paid if you show and sell that house. Oh, well, maybe you're not going to show and sell that house. You're going to do, a, let's say it's a lower commission than what you want. Well, hello, we have the internet. Do you think you can actually hide homes from buyers these days? Yeah. And also as a realtor, are you going to say to the buyer, well, you know, I, I would like to show you this house, but I can't because I'm not going to be paid. So all of their arguments are just so far-fetched. It really, really, really is. And as a broker, I feel like when we look at it, and you've also mentioned this too, and you look at um, what the market will bear. Yep. Is it price fixing that all the airlines have a, a range of what tickets are? Hmm. What about if you go and you get um, new tires put on your car? It's interesting. The pricing is all very similar. So are they price fixing? They're coming after us because they see us as the low hanging fruit. And yes. this attorney has kind of gotten in their head. And now we've got these copycats. We can justify all day long, every day, what we charge, especially because the commissions, the, the market hasn't increased. If yep. you look at the prices of things, gas prices go up. Um, insurance goes up. Let's, we don't even want to yeah. start the conversation. No, no, so the chat. <laughs> like insurance, okay, I didn't say that. Yeah. But all these things go up. And if you really look at the, if you want to say standard, the realm of what's been kind of acceptable that the brokers personally are making their own choices on, it's yep. kind of, it's, it's, it's an alignment with what you're going to be ex, uh, ex, uh, spending in, as the cost of doing business. You know, brokerages yep. have expenses. Even as an agent, you're not sitting there getting compensated for your gas, the wear and tear on your car. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. No, I know. And, and, and again, we can, it, it's really hard because again, we know, we know what we do. We know the value proposition. I will also say, you know, we can all take accountability though, because at the height of the market as a listing agent, 
How many times did you see with mutual friends and everything else? Look what I can do. I just stuck this sign in the yard and I sold it for $92,000 over asking with 47 offers in 72 hours. Yes. And you sit there and you go, guys, gosh, stop. That was a great job. Yes, you did a great job garnering that result for your seller. But why don't you talk about the story behind it, the preparation and getting the listing, you know, on, on the market, ha having those qualitative conversations on maybe some pre-listing repairs and cosmetic updates and staging and professional photography and being able to balance the act of, of having four children and two dogs and, yeah. you know, all of these other things. And you sit there and say, this is how I advocated for this seller. And that's how we got the result. Exactly. Instead of saying, look what I can do. You know, the, the, when I see realtors and they, they post on Facebook, Oh, just, you know, sold this million dollar house in two days. It makes me crazy because we are almost our worst enemy because who really cares about that? Like, really? Oh, do we care? I don't care. Do you care? No, I really no. don't. You know what that no. means instead, Christine? If I'm having a bad month and I go, oh, Ashley Gentry, oh, you just closed this month, you know? <laughs> good good for you. The other thing we've done, though, is, as as brokerages, and, and I know we've been guilty of it, you know, in the past is agents want the recognition for their production levels so that they can share and they can tell, you know, hey, I am doing a good job. I mean, that right. feels good, right? When you yes, get recognized yes. for what you do. But- the flip of that is by constantly recognizing the levels of production, multi-million dollar producer and all of these other things, it's giving the image yes. to the direct consumer that we're literally like what daddy Warbucks over here and making right. hand over fist tons of money. Yes. And, and that unfortunately is not the case. Right. But again, we have to take ownership that we've kind of curated this type of marketing to really put us under this microscope of, you guys are rolling in the dough while the rest of us are hurting. Consumers yes. are bleeding. Buyers are having to overpay for properties, you know, all of these other things. And so we can do better. Yes. And if you guys are on here tonight, if you take nothing away from this, except the fact of control what you can yes. and start telling the story of how using Ashley Gentry or Christine Hansen to represent, you know, your client and you sit there and say, this is what I did. This is the Christine difference, you know, and articulate why, why somebody should hire you over the next five agents. That's what we need to get it back to. So, um, you know, there's, uh, so let's go to Michelle. Michelle said buyer's mother in Illinois is saying realtors overpriced the listing of homes to pay buyer's commissions. How did it get through appraisal and feds to loan the funds if it's overpriced? It's yeah. actually a good point, Michelle. Right. 100%. When we got that verdict, we heard about the verdict in Missouri. We're like, okay, so what you're basically saying is all of the homes need to come down and be adjusted by that two and a half percent that you're claiming is was you're overpaid by. So now your prices are going to go down. Like, let's talk about that. Um, the other thing if with every realtor that's listening to this, this can seem overwhelming. It can be yep. scary. It seems like a lot and it really is. And the one thing that I can tell you and the most important thing, because right now business is still being done. Yes. We're working with buyers and sellers is to be able to take that breath, just mm -hmm. take that moment. And if someone asks you, you know, Hey, what is your commission? They're probably asking like they would have a year ago. Don't mm -hmm. jump into, oh my gosh, they're reading these articles. They're, you know, the overreaction. Remember, I went back yes. to the thing. I'm afraid people are going to overreact. And what I just talked to my realtors about was I said to them, listen, anybody, anybody that is coming in and doing a listing pre presentation for a for sale by owner, if we remember back when we used to have yeah. them, we're still coming. We had to be able to show them the value of what a listing agent does and then yep. explain yep. to them the value of opening up their property to the open market for fair cooperation and yep. compensation. The foundation still stands. And so I want everyone really, really to, to kind of just go back to the roots, go back to the foundation, and yep. then don't yep. forget you're worth it. Don't forget well, that you're worth this money. You know, know your value. Well, we had a women's summit here a couple of weeks ago, and I remember it was the day the verdict came out and uh, they were sitting there and they're like, we just, I mean, there's a hundred women in the room. We were all at different tables and they just looked at me and they're like, I don't know what to do. I mean, yeah. maybe I need to get a job. I mean, I, how am I going to say this to buyers? What if they do this? And I said, you know, we'll call her Becky. Her name wasn't Becky. I'm like, Becky, what's your value proposition? You know, right. I'm like, what does this look like? Hey, just role play with me right now. If you're sitting there and represent, 
should you get paid when you represent a buyer? Well, of course. Right. Why should you get paid? What do you do? And and she basically just said, I'm scared to have that conversation. Right. And and I and I said, I get it. But if you're scared to have that conversation, then you need to get some additional training because you can't be scared to articulate your value proposition to either the seller or your buyer in that conversation. That's what you need to hone in on because you are worth it. You are a champion for your clients. And so I think we need to kind of refocus and, and we keep on talking about training and fundamentals and foundational principles and things like that. I'm going to throw something out there. You know, of course, we're members of the, the trade association. And while everybody says, oh, we got so many members and dues and money and everything else. Yes, that does help fund budgets to help us have education, programming, resources, technology, advocacy, all the things that we do. At the same time, I am still by Travis Lee. That wasn't by Felicia in a bad way. That's my buddy. Um, <laughs> so um, it's it's not about any of that. You know, my biggest thing, though, is then from a realtor practitioner that knows you're going to be here on the other side. I've been licensed for almost 20 years. Christine, you've been doing this for nearly 40. You know, we've seen some down markets. We know we're going to get on the other side of this. And where there's crisis and chaos and friction, there's also opportunity. And there's opportunity because the realtors that aren't in it for the right reason will get out. Because exactly. it is going to get a little harder. So that's yes. actually kind of exciting when yes. you get to sit there and gain some market share and trust and respect because yeah. you're going to be in here when the times get tough and when they're easy. When um, go there, ahead. there was the back when the market was like super great and they had all these um, companies that everyone was like, oh my gosh, the real estate's going to change and they're going to take us away. And they didn't. Market yep. shifts, things happen. Right now, it's ex very complex to buy a property. And I think that people want realtors that are going to guide them and they're appreciating what we do. The, yes. this, these lawsuits, it's like a, a, a rogue money-making thing. Our public that, that comes to us each and every day needs us. And that's not going to go away. You know, we talked about something and, and this is real talk. So I might rub people a real way. Um, but look, there's a lot of people that jumped in to becoming a realtor over the past three years. And that's okay. You know, if you're entrepreneurial and you see, and, and obviously businesses closed and, and, and different things happened and people got laid off and they had to figure out how to be agile. And a lot of people got into real estate for that reason too. But a lot of people got into real estate thinking it was easy money. I told you, we, I see these Facebook groups of, of salespeople. It's, it's, not any one profession. And it's like, hey, I've been killing it in solar sales for the last five years and I want to try something different. Should I get into roofing? Should I do insurance or maybe real estate? And you're like, how do we get in the same mindset of like roofing and solar? Yes. Because when I was a kid and when I first got in the business, it was like there were realtors, accountants, lawyers, I mean, I know lawyers yeah. get a bad rap too, but we were in this higher level of professional competency as far as what that looked like. And so I have to say that it's devolved because we've kind of stopped articulating our worth and our value proposition to an extent. And so we need to raise that industry standard again, even if it's one client or one agent at a time. Self-accountability and then peer accountability is something that we need to continue to do. Um, <laughs> Francie Bill, you are a great mover though. That is one of our esteemed affiliates, Francie Bill with fantastic moves. Um, yes. so she's, uh, yes, you, moving is, is, is something that we need from your side too. Um, Michelle, she said, this call is great. Could you please do this maybe monthly? As there are a lot of questions and suggestions, maybe NAR attorneys could join also with questions realtors have sure. Michelle. Hey, we're here every other week. Um, we do try to do different topics on real talk and in fact, December 12th, we will have, um, we will be doing it on insurance. So I know we touched on that and the, the yes. catastrophic losses and everything else. Um, but I think the biggest thing is with the last 12 minutes that we have here, Christine, because it does go fast. Um, I know. It, right. It does go fast. There's a part of the buyers um, that we want to, I want to talk about and not so much about the buyer's class action lawsuit, but going back to how we can talk about, especially to sellers, um, when, when they're saying, well, Hey, you know, even if they have seen it, you know, or want to have a conversation about, uh, compensation and compensating a buyer's agent, what we do need to have is who is going to be hurt or marginalized 
um, by sitting there and all of a sudden putting the default. And, and look, if you don't compensate the buyer's agent or offering a certain compensation to a buyer's agent that the buyer's agent charges, that's fine. But when you're talking about taking away the mechanism altogether, Christine, can you talk about, you know, who do we think is really going to be significantly marginalized by not even being able to compensate the buyer's agent from the, the listing broker? Absolutely, Ashley. This is really an important topic because if they did, and I can't imagine it would be like restricting trade, right? How would they take that away? But let's say that you could not offer a buyer's agent commission. You couldn't offer them money as a listing agent or as a seller. Think about this now, each and each and every one of us were realtors. So you have two different buyers that call you on the same day. One buyer says, I'm a cash buyer. I'm looking for a six to $800,000 home. I've got, you know, a month or two that I can buy. Here's my credit. I've got my funds. I'm ready to go. And then another buyer calls you and they say, we're first time home buyers. We're not really sure what market we're in. Um, we probably will have to ask for some closing costs. Our credit's a little bit iffy. And I'm just going to throw in, we have a really large dog. <laughs> Got to throw yeah. that in. Right? <laughs> you know, and and these, these buyers are asking you to help them and you're going to charge fees. So which one first are you going to spend more time with? And I think we can all guess which one that's going to be. Yeah. And which one is going to benefit from a lower fee because it's faster, easier, and smoother. So the people, if you really want to look at it, the people that are underserved, the people that are minorities, the people that right now we're trying to help them elevate to get the American dream, to be part of the, the, the home ownership that we all want to enjoy, those are the ones that are going to be harmed. Because if we're realtors and we only have so much time in the day, we're going to end up having to go with the, the, the buyers that can A, afford to pay us, and that are easy where there's a market for them. Just like an attorney, if they have to choose who they're going to work with, they're going to go with an easier case or one that they think they can win. So, and, and that's, I saw in, in the thing about the VAs, absolutely. That's the other thing is it's, there's nothing wrong with when you're doing a loan that the VA, that the sellers have to pay certain costs for a buyer. We have deals where sellers get to pay closing costs for a buyer, yep. which goes to mortgage brokers and mortgages. So, you know, will this be taken away? No. Now we just have to drill down to how do we hold on to the industry that we love, the way we do business, tell our story and stay with NAR and these other companies as they fight through this. So like Mark said, my concern is our first time home buyers and specifically the veterans VA will not let buyers pay a buyer's agent commission. And that stance isn't changing. Right. Given our affordability challenges, I can't imagine buyers being able to stomach buying. Yes. And, and that's that's really something that that we're all having to have those conversations about. And, and from the lending side, yeah, the VA is probably not going to budge on that because the no. VA is trying to protect the veteran, right? They're right. trying to put them and tee them up for immense long-term success. And so so when you look at that, you go, man, that's so challenging. But it's so interesting to me because you sit there and you go, okay, there's buyers that don't have the ability to pay their own closing costs. So what do right. we do? We bring a great offer to the seller and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, um, you know, we want to buy your property. But we, we, we're good with the price, but we love to negotiate you helping us with some seller contributions exactly. to help us with the closing costs. Right. And so you're sitting there and the seller's going, Hey, this is great. They have the terms. This is what I wanted to net. Fantastic. They seem really invested. They're from this area. All of these things. They go, I would love to work with that buyer. Okay, that's fantastic. Did it change the stance of how? I mean, back in the day, you did have the older generation. I'm not paying for their closing costs. Um, now that's not something that you bring into consideration. But so why is it a problem that you sit there and you negotiate or that the seller is offering to pay the buyer's agent commission so the buyer can bring the most well-balanced and aggressive offer to yeah. the seller? And yeah. that's where, how are they going to make an argument with VA saying buyers are not allowed to pay commissions and then now have this lawsuit? So that's why there's so many legal stances here. There are so many legal arguments. There are so many uh, examples yes. of what we do. I, I mean, even we all come together, we share data, we share ideas, we share training. We do things like this. Everything is yeah. open and we still compete for the business. Gosh, and they're, yes. they're trying to sue us for helping people get the American dream. It's just, you know, I just I just hope that everybody can hang in there, be involved, stay involved, but don't go to the side of negativity. 
No. Right no. now, yes, it's a challenge. But as Ashley said, we will come out of this on yes. the right side of this and we will be better. And we have to hang in on that and not let us affect today's business because right now we need to be out there helping people buy and sell property. So we cannot let this bog us down. No, absolutely. That doesn't that that doesn't stop business as usual. In fact, it right. shouldn't be business as usual. It should be business ramped it's better. up. Yes. yes, it's better business. And so I can talk about from Metrotech side, Christine, you know, we've been having these really qualitative conversations even before we went to trial. And our biggest thing was, I know people have said in regards to, and we've got five minutes left, so we'll make it a short five minutes so you guys can't dogpile on it. Um, but, you know, talking about a choice, right? A choice yes. to be a member of, of the National Association. Um, subsequently, you know, the three-party way agreement, um, you know, between your local, state, and national. And yes. so the biggest thing we just kept on saying from the Metrotech side, guys, we need to be looking through every decision that we're doing. Is this an individual member value proposition? Everything we do, every decision we make, bringing programming, education, technology, resources, you know, forums, whatever we're doing, how is this, is this going to positively impact an individual member, not a brokerage, not our top performers or anything else, because everybody pays the same level of dues. How is this going to impact? And if we look at through that rubric with every decision we make as a local association, we win. And our goal is to be that extension of these amazing brokerages and mentors and, and managers and to sit there and say, hey, we're going to help you. We're going to help bring these national speakers. We're going to help bring the additional value proposition. We're going to help bring the technology so Christine and her agents can be the top of the business. And Christine, can go and turn around and say, hey, Metrotex has an amazing forum on advocacy and what's going on in local legislation right now and property tax reform and everything else. And that's something I want you guys to know about. So you need to go to, to Metrotex next Wednesday because they're putting on a great forum where we can ask questions about what's going on with property tax relief. You know, everything we need to do needs to have a value prop. And so I want our listeners that are our members and not even our members, all of the local associations and, and trade associations from the realtor side, that is our goal. It's not just to take the money and run. You know, this is a member run organization. And I welcome members coming to the table and saying, hey, I want to have a voice and how the members dollars um, are doled out. And that's yeah. something that I wanted to. Again, it's why I'm sitting here. And by the way, it's really fun if you want to sit here and come through a 300 page budget line by <laughs> line and sit there and be good stewards of that budget specifically this year and say, hey, guys, no line item is off the table because we are going to budget conservatively and make right. sure that we can be fiscally responsible on our members dues and make sure that that we can do that add value and be fiscally responsible. And that's the same thing that we can do for our clients. Yeah add value and be fiscally responsible for your clients, guys. Absolutely. Um, I so encourage every, every realtor, you know, to be involved with their local association, get involved with the local association and then be the voice. You know, it, it starts with us, meaning you, me, we have to be the ones that take, get involved. So we learn yep. so much more and then take it out to others. Yep. So we've got three minutes left. Shanae Ragsdale, Hello, Shanae. Um, one of the points of contention is that agents steer customers away from homes not offering to pay or paying lower fees to buyer's agents on the MLS. Do you think MLS will change to not show buyer's agent fees on MLS? Yeah, there are a lot of areas and a lot of states that are, have already implemented that. Um, I think it'd be great. I remember Adorna Carroll coming in that same that same leadership module that I was telling you about, Christine, and she was sitting there and go, don't even look at it. You shouldn't even be looking at that field. As agents, we shouldn't even be looking at it because you should be able to articulate your value as a buyer's agent. And if you can't, you're going to get caught flat-footed. That was five years ago that she was well, saying that. So so since this is real talk and you said that we can get really blunt or whatever is, Go the other it. side of that is, is that we're in business to make money. And yeah. so I do feel that we need to have a way to know if I'm, and I, so I do agree, you should not in any way, shape or form ever not show a buyer because the yep. compensation isn't what you want. You have to negotiate that compensation with your buyer. Absolutely, yep. 100%. Yep. But I also think that we shouldn't be compelled or made to feel bad because we want a certain fee for the business that we do. So yes. we have to, like you said, show our value. There has to be a way that we're able to articulate, here's our fee. 
if yep. what so whatever property and the other thing is buyers have access to listings so if you're trying to not show a property because it's a lower commission the buyer's going to find it anyway yeah. And then you're going to end up hurting your relationship with that buyer. So there, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. But I want us to make sure that we don't cave yeah. and say, well, OK, I'm going to take a lot less because that's all they're offering me and not know the value to be able to, you know, it's a business you deserve to make the money. Christine, we're, commissions, different commissions, uh, offerings and everything else have been going on for years. This isn't anything new. You know, I charge a certain fee when I'm representing my client, my buyer. And yes. you know the conversation that I have with them? Hey, oh, Ashley, is this, so am I going to pay this fee? Hey, look, often the, the listing broker is offering the compensation in which I charge. And if they're not, I will have that conversation with you situationally house to house. But understand also, sometimes they might not be offering the compensation that I charge you, Mrs. Buyer, but I will tell you right now, sometimes they're not marketing it appropriately. Maybe they haven't got a listing ready. Maybe they have it undervalued by $50,000. Maybe I'm going to be able to negotiate seller's contributions on your behalf. So you might have to take on part of my commission. But if I can get you $45,000 in additional negotiations, you're still doing okay. Ashley, that sounds great. I just want you to let me know situationally, house to house, if that's a piece of the acquisition pie that I'm going to have to take into consideration. And right. so getting proactive communication on the front end, yes. we're talking about our representation agreements and what we charge. And like you said, don't back down. You know, back. you you know what your worth is, guys. And I think that's the bit. And don't feel bad right. about articulating what you charge and what your worth is. And if and you have tr trouble with that, find somebody that can help you figure it out. Just, just listening to Ashley, everyone on this call knows this isn't the first time she's done that. So take it. If you're uncomfortable with something, dive in. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Grab a colleague in your office. Yes. Role play it. We hate the role playing. Get it to the point where this is second nature, where you yes. can own exactly what you do, how you do it, and why you're important and valuable to your customer and client. Don't shy away from that. Yes. Hashtag acquisition pie. Okay, we can make that a new hashtag, Travis Lee. But, you know, I, I appreciate everybody. Um, Christina, I told you it would go fast. We had these things and we were going to start to chart out what we talked and we knew we would have great commentary and questions today. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Christina, is there anything that you want to leave our viewers with this evening that we haven't already touched on? Uh, nothing except for just, just remember your value. You guys have this. Don't react. Let's carefully respond and just yes. remember that you deserve the money that yeah. you make. And I want to be invited back. So you got to bug Ashley and say, get that crazy girl, Christine back on here. Okay. One, we love crazy girls. And of course I'm going to have you come <laughs> back and we're going to continue on these conversations. And I will tell you, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person next week in Anaheim at the yeah. national convention, where we are going to continue to have uh, continued real talks in person with one another, with leaders across the country. So guys, thank you so much, Christine. I will see you at Anaheim and uh, we will see you again on Real Talk. Have a great evening and we'll see you guys very soon.